Today I was feeling a bit nostalgic, so I decided to revisit an old friend. You know, a bit of orange and his creepy bear. Sometimes I go back to my old videos and think, hmm, I wonder what they've been up to. Most actually either stopped uploading or switched to a different video style, such as a podcast or something. But then there's some that is still uploading the same types of videos, which honestly makes me happy to see. A bit of orange seems to have hit a bit of a roadblock with his upload schedule, so let's wake him up a bit. Alright, in case you guys don't remember, the brown bear represents the Evolution 101 website, content written as introductory evolutionary biology for, I guess, high schoolers? And this guy with the blue shirt is trying to debunk the brown bear. Just remember the stuff presented by this creepy bear is from the Evolution 101 website, written by the Understanding Evolution Team! <laughs> I miss this. In fact, biologists have a lot to say about what is and is not an adaptation. Misconceptions about natural selection. Wait a minute, the bear's voice changed. You can't fool me, that's a different bear. Well, I guess the content is from the same website, so we'll let that slide for now. Because natural selection can produce amazing adaptations... Okay, hold on again. Natural selection can produce adaptations. Give me a second, I'm gonna write this down in my notebook and save it for later. Yep, that is indeed true. Natural selection can produce amazing adaptations. Notice how the wording is quite specific here. We're producing adaptations, not new traits, because natural selection is the guiding process that determines the genes that have to be eliminated and what genes stay. This is in response to the environment you are looking at, which is why the word adaptation is used so often in evolutionary biology. Its process changes entirely depending on where the population lives and what genes already exist in the gene pool. It's not objective in any sense, but it is powerful. For example, if you have a population of finches and put them in a drought, the finch with longer beaks will survive better, and thus the population will gradually get longer beaks. This was observed directly by Darwin himself and is one of the most common examples we provide in textbooks. If you take a population of peppered moths and put them in a darker atmosphere filled with coal pollution, you'll get darker moths. These are great examples of adaptation that we've directly observed. Because natural selection can produce amazing adaptations, it is tempting to think of it as an all-powerful force urging organisms on, constantly pushing them in the direction of progress. But this is not what natural selection is like at all. <laughs> that is correct. It's more like a forest fire or a controlled burn, destroying certain things and leaving others behind. To be clear on this point, young earth creationists have no problem with the process of natural selection. We discovered it. We simply understand that it is not a creative force. It subtracts. It does not add. This depends on what you mean by subtract or add. If you're talking about the diversity of genes, then yes, it does subtract. But if you're talking about the overall number of genes, then it doesn't change it. However, just because it reduces diversity by selecting out certain traits does not mean the overall trend is negative. That's because there are a number of forces that happen at the same time, natural selection being only one of them, and it's the combination of everything together that makes evolution what it is. Again, I don't want to get all fundy right-wing Baptist evangelical on you, but if an effect requires that you add, then you can't cause it by subtracting. That's a little trick I like to call math. I hope I'm not getting too technical for you. If natural selection is the only driving force of evolution, then yes, it wouldn't be able to do anything. But luckily for us, we have mechanisms that do add genetic diversity, mutations being the prime example. First, natural selection is not all powerful. It does not produce perfection. If your genes are good enough, you'll get some offspring into the next generation. You don't have to be perfect. This should be pretty clear just by looking at the populations around us. People may have the genes for genetic diseases. Plants may not have the genes to survive a drought. A predator may not be quite fast enough to catch her prey every time she's hungry. No population or organism is perfectly adapted. <laughs> now we're talking metaphysics, not science. What would a perfect animal look like? Sophia Loren? Well, I'm not saying it isn't worth thinking about. I'm just saying we've left the realm of science and have gotten philosophical. No, this is not philosophical whatsoever. This is just biology and population genetics. The bear is 100% correct. You don't need to be absolutely perfect to have your genes passed on. And I know that when we talk about evolutionary biology, it's incredibly easy to oversimplify things. For example, you've heard me say multiple times that the organisms with genes more suited for the environment survives and passes on their genes while the others die. But in reality, it's not actually black and white like that. You don't just survive or not survive. Each organism, along with their genes, can technically be marked with a percent chance of being passed on. We've built many mathematical mathematical models on things that are dependent on chances. Without going into too much detail, these can give us good predictive chances on whether or not a gene will pass on. From an individual's point of view, that doesn't mean you need to own all of the favorable genes. You can even have all of the bad traits and still survive and reproduce. I mean, look in the mirror, you're a living example of that. But of course, having more favorable genes is not a bad thing and will help you increase your chances of producing offspring. And we can even think of the number of offspring to be somewhat correlated with adaptation as well. The more suited you are, the more offspring you will potentially have. And of course, that's a very simplistic view of the general idea of an evolutionary model, but you get the idea. Second, it's more accurate to think of natural selection as a process rather than a guiding hand. 
I actually think a guiding hand is fine simply because we deal with a lot of probability here, but I do suppose process is better. Natural selection is the simple result of variation, differential reproduction, and heredity. It is mindless and mechanistic. It has no goals. It's not striving to produce progress or a balanced ecosystem. This part is true. No part of evolution has goals. But not every evolutionist knows this, which is why some teach pre-adaptive evolution. <laughs> no, really. The theory here is that evolution can cause cells or species to hold on to something which, while useless now, will come in handy once they've evolved a few more parts. <laughs> Wow, I didn't think a creationist could really grasp the concept of pre-adaptation. But then again, I don't think he fully understood it either, so I retract that statement. Normally I wouldn't respond to this since it isn't very related to what the bear said, but I feel the need to clarify this point anyway. Pre-adaptation is sort of a loaded word, but the concept can be simplified. A population could potentially adapt to an environment shift that has yet to happen before it happens. This isn't because the genes have incredible foresight, but rather this is by chance on what was experienced previously. For example, a population of plants adapted slightly already to drought conditions because in their normal habitat cycles, there was a brief and temporary period of drought. Plants adapted to that temporary drought, but then it disappears, returning back to its normal environment. But plants that are more resistant to droughts end up sticking around, despite their resistance being limited in use. Then later, there is a real long-term drought that befalls the land. When this happens, the plants that are already resistant to dry weather will suddenly be well adapted. In other words, they pre-adapted to the future change of the environment. But of course, pre-adaptation seems like a too-good-to-be-true scenario. But if you consider the vast number of environmental changes, it's not that uncommon after all. We don't really talk about this too much in our biology classes, since it is indeed a very specific case, but it does exist. That being said, it's important to distinguish this as not having foresight. It's entirely by chance, so the bear still stands corrected in that evolution has no goals or intentions. This also shows that natural selection is specific to the environment. This is why need, try, and want are not very accurate words when it comes to explaining evolution. The population or individual does not want or try to evolve and natural selection cannot try to supply what an organism needs. Natural selection just selects among whatever variation exists in the population. The result is evolution. Did you catch that? Wait, wait. Natural selection just selects among whatever variation exists in the population. I couldn't have said that better myself, even though I've already said it. Remember, in the previous section they said, adaptations are well fitted to their function and are produced by natural selection. Do I need to say more? But that's really just the fault of our language system, not the theory of evolution itself. At the end of the day, it's easy to think in ways in which our language, in this case English, is confining us into and what certain implications of words mean. When we say evolution produces, you may think that evolution had an intention here, but it doesn't. These adaptations are just the result of evolution. That doesn't mean the wording can't be rephrased here, it definitely can. But when reading science, you have to ensure to keep a scientific mindset and remove certain biases on implication of words which otherwise would be valid in casual settings. That's why scientific papers often use this third person or passive voice because they sound more objective. Evolution 101, being a resource for people who have little to no understanding of evolution, is using friendlier language for a scientifically illiterate audience. I don't see the problem, especially since they clarified evolution and his non-existent intentions. Anyway, I'm going to skip a bit here since he goes on a little bit too much regarding the word choices. We've already been over this, but removing parts from the Honda Odyssey does not produce the Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. Oh, how I wish it did! That would be true if you are looking at solely natural selection by itself, which the process of evolution does not. At the opposite end of scale, natural selection is sometimes interpreted as a random process. This is also a misconception. The genetic variation that occurs in a population because of mutation is random, but selection acts on that variation in a very non-random way. Genetic variants that aid survival and reproduction are much more likely to become common than variants that don't. Natural selection is not random. <laughs> that is a bold assertion, but you have to admit, a very weak argument. Especially when you couple this idea with the genetic drift concept they've already put forth. If you recall, stepping on some beetles causes the population to evolve. If becoming roadkill isn't random, I'm not sure what is. Yes, but you're citing an example of genetic drift, which is by chance. But genetic drift is another mechanism of evolution that is not natural selection. Natural selection is not random. Genetic drift is. The bear is talking solely about natural selection here. 
But natural selection cannot cause anything to happen any more than separating vegetables from squash can create a pumpkin. Yeah, so the confusion here is solely on thinking that natural selection is the embodiment of evolution. It's not. It's only a mechanism of evolution, but an important one at that. It's the greatest factor when it comes to selecting which genes stay, and facilitates the direction in which a population moves. By itself, natural selection can't do anything, but together with all the other mechanisms such as mutations, genetic drift, gene flow, it becomes a great force that can indeed give us complex evolutionary changes over millions and billions of years. Step 1 to understanding evolution is to know that it is not the same as natural selection, but rather an umbrella term. 